All right, uh, so if you've learned Java before in the past, uh, the next uh, three or four, I guess, lectures, roughly, uh, should largely be reviewed to you. Um, if you haven't learned Java in the past, so if Java, you're brand new to Java, or if you're brand new to uh, Java-like language, so something like C or C++ or C Sharp, uh, again, it should, this should largely be review for you. If you're only programming experience in Python, uh, you want, you're gonna wanna pay attention um, to the next few lectures. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you stuff in Python that you should uh, be aware of, and then I'm gonna show you how to translate that into Java. All right, so you can build on your programming experience that you've acquired using Python, uh, and hopefully it, uh, the stuff I'm telling you will translate simply into Java. All right, so you know that uh, if you want to make a simple Python program, um, anything special that you have to do. Uh, you can open up a file, and you can do something like print, and then round brackets, and then hello world, and that will produce the uh, classic hello world program that every uh, computer scientist ends up learning how to program. Right, and so you can have a single line long, and there's nothing special about it. So one of the criticisms with Java is that this isn't true. Right. In order to produce the hello world, pro hello world program in Java, uh, you have to do a fair bit more work. Um, so there's a whole bunch of stuff that you have to write because the language requires it just to print out a string to the, ter uh, to the terminal. Right. And so uh, the equivalent program in Java looks as follows. Right. And so in Python, when you run a Python script, the script starts to run from top to bottom the order in which you started running things in, uh, unless it has a main function uh, and, you run the uh, and you run the script um, in a particular way, right? So in Java, uh, to run a Java program, somewhere there has to be a method called main, which is what this thing in red is, right? So all that stuff in red um, is, uh, the, is one form of the Java main method, right? And this is where your program will start to run from. Okay, now the main method can have more than one form, so it's allowed to have two. So the other way to write it is as follows. Right? So notice there's only one change, right? Here there's dot, dot, dot. Here there's square brackets, right? They are both legal. Uh, and in uh, this particular case, they both mean exactly the same thing, right? So both forms of this main method are saying uh, that the main method can be called by passing in zero or more uh, string arguments in this case. Right, so that's all it's trying to tell you. Right, now normally when you run a program, you don't call main yourself, right? So I'm gonna show you, in a, oh, well I'll show you how to do this now. So in Eclipse, uh, which is the IDE that we're using in this course. Uh, is there a, hang on, I'm gonna try, oh I can, good. All right, so I'm gonna make that little hello world program there's an existing program sitting right here right now. Um, let's ignore that for the moment. Uh, so when you first open up Eclipse, uh, it's gonna ask you for something called the workspace. That's just a directory where it wants to store all of your Eclipse projects. You can make whatever workspace you want. You can use the default, it's fine. Okay. Uh, after you do that, um, you're gonna have to make a Java project. So I've already got one called Lecture 2. Uh, if, you're on, uh, if you look at the video on OnCue, it shows you how to run your first uh, Eclipse project, or create and run your first Eclipse project. So that's all on OnCue for you. I'm just gonna show you quickly how to make a new class so that I can actually make this Hello World program, right? So I'm gonna right click or go to the file menu and do new. Then I'm gonna do class, and I'm gonna make a new class, right? Uh, I'm gonna call it Hello World. Uh, and And I would prefer not to have to type in everything myself. So I'm gonna click this little box here that says add a main method and I'm gonna click finish, right? And it spits out a little program for you. Okay. All right, so uh, once you've got your little program started, you can actually fill in the code that you need to um, write your method. So system out print ln. All right, so again, notice that this is a lot more verbose than Python. You have to write a lot of stuff just to get print something. 
right? I can't just write print, I've got to write system, then dot out, then dot print ln, and then my string inside the round brackets, right? And all of this has to be here. If it's not here, your program won't work. So if you just try to write print ln, uh, Eclipse is gonna complain, so it's gonna underline the print ln, there's gonna be a little x over here, and it's gonna complain, it's gonna say the method print is undefined, right? That's because it is, there is no method called print, it's system.out.println. Like that. Right. So again, it's a lot more verbose than Python, it's just something you're gonna have to get used to, there's no way to work around it. Right. Once you've edited your file, you can save it, so file save, right. or control S, command S if you're on a Mac. Right. And then once you've got all that set up, you can actually try to run your program. Right, so the, there's a little green button up here that looks like a little arrow. It looks like a play button on an old um, cassette player. Uh, if you press that, something will happen. And uh, down here in your console, uh, you'll get your um, output. So it says hello world. Uh, and so there's how, there's very quickly how to create a little Java program um, in Eclipse. Uh, so notice that uh, this is one of the reasons why I actually went, took the effort to make the notebooks for you. It's a lot easier if you're just trying to do stuff to go into the notebook. I don't have to type in all of this stuff. I don't have to make a class. I don't have to make a main method, right? Uh, you can run small fragments of code from inside uh, the notebook itself. Okay, so you need a main method to have a running Java program, right? That's another, that's, a bit, that's the first big difference. Okay, there also has to be something called a class because you can't have a method that lives on its own. So in other words, I can't just make the main method. Right? All methods in Java live inside things called classes or uh, interfaces. Uh, so I don't have to make just the main method, I also have to make the class. And so here, I've got this public class and then hello world. So a class is just, in Java, is uh, for the time being, it's just the way that you have to make a program. Um, but later on, you're gonna learn that what a class corresponds to in Java is what's called a user-defined type. Right? And I'll explain more about that in the uh, coming lectures. Right? So for now, we need a class of some kind. Right? Uh, for now, take it for granted that this has to be public. Right? You need the, little, the word little c class, and then you have to give your class a name. Right? And so there's a naming convention in Java. Right? Unlike Python, where there isn't really one type of naming convention. Right? So in Java, uh, the naming convention for a class uh, is that it always starts with a capital letter. Right? And if it's made up of multiple words, uh, each word in the name is also capitalized. Right? So big H, hello, and big D, W, world. Right? And that's simply the convention that Java programmers have agreed should be used uh, for uh, creating, for naming classes, right? Please don't interrupt me like that. You've been in this class before, you know the rules, right? Okay. So, there's my world, there's my class world, hello world. Now, the interesting thing about this is that uh, the program that reads your program and turns it into a running program Eclipse, as far as you're concerned, doesn't actually care what you name it, right? And so if I go back to Eclipse, right, I can click on the class name and I can ask Eclipse to rename it. So I'm gonna do something, it's gonna refactor, rename. I'll explain why you, have to, uh, why you should do it this way in just a second, right? And I can call it something else. So I can break convention and call it hello world little dw, right? Press enter. And as far as Eclipse is concerned, everything's great. Right? If your eyes are much better than mine, you might notice over here, right, that's where your file actually lives on your disk. That's the actual file that corresponds to this uh, class. Right? So for every class that you create, uh, you end up creating a file that has the exact same name as the class by .java. Right? So for my hello world class, there's a corresponding hello world.java file. Right, the contents of that file is simply that right there. Right. So it looks like Eclipse is perfectly happy with this and you can run this program uh, and it will work just fine, and it does. Right. And so this rule, 
where you should be naming your classes using upper camel case. Right? It's not a rule imposed by the language, it's a rule or a convention imposed by uh, the Java community in general. Right? So I'm gonna fix this, put it back. Uh, sorry. Okay, now you might wonder why I'm going through this business of doing a, this uh, refactor rename thing. Okay. And so the reason I'm doing this is because if I don't, so if I just go up here and edit the name of the class, um, Eclipse is gonna complain, right? So it's still underlined in red, right? And if you can read the error, it says the public type hello world must be defined in its own file. It's trying to tell you this class big H hello w needs to be in the file big H hello big, DW, uh, big W world. And it's not, it's in all lowercase hello world, right? So if you do this, you have to rename the file as well, which sucks. So uh, it's much easier uh, to ask Eclipse to do all of this for you. So if you refactor and rename, uh, Eclipse is smart enough to know that you it must also change, sorry, it must also change the name of the file. Okay, so big H, big DW, big DW. Press enter, right? And it will, oh, uh, 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 oh, blast, hang on. Okay, so now I'm gonna have to do it the hard way. Uh, so the other way you can do this is to, once you hover on the error, you can choose rename the file to hello world.java and that will also fix the issue. Okay, and so you can now run that again and everything's fine again, right? So again, awkward, right, compared to Python, right? Python, name your file whatever you want and away you go. Uh, for the most part, um, sorry, uh, yeah, for the most part, right? Uh, Java, there is this funny naming convention and the naming convention has, uh, and the, there's a, also a requirement that whatever your class is named, it has to have a matching, uh, it has to be saved using that class name. Um, as well. Oops, sorry. Where is my here? Okay. Okay. So the there are other rules related to what you can name a class, right? And so a class name has to start with a letter uh, or an underscore, right? So that's a shift. Oh, sorry. It's a separate key on most keyboards, right? So you are allowed to use an underscore in a name, but you are generally encouraged not to, right? You can't start the name with a number or a symbol, so it has to be a letter of some kind, right? Oh, so the first assignment, uh, actually for the first assignment, I make the class for you, so you don't have to worry about doing this in the first assignment. Right. Yes, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I'm gonna get to that. Okay, so the other big difference compared to Python is that um, these things called statements in both languages always end, uh, sorry, uh, usually end in a semicolon, oh. right? So right there on that line that actually prints hello world, it ends on a semicolon, right? In Python, the semicolon uh, is, uh, does not have to be there, right? It's allowed to be there if you want it to be there. Python programmers don't put it in, right? So in Java, in Java you must have that semicolon there. If you try to take it out, right, uh, Eclipse or the, your compiler will complain, right? The compiler is the program that converts this Java file into a, into a Java class. Hang on just a second, right? So you see right here, uh, you can see that there's an error here. If you try to run the program, it's not gonna work. This is asking me to save because I made an edit, right? And you see here it says there's an error. If you proceed, it's gonna barf it down here. Right, and it says there's a syntax error and through the semicolon. So, there we go. Right, so there's your semicolon. So semicolons have to be there. Yes, question. Uh, so, by the first of time, the name, right? Uh, is there a right name package A1? Yes, it should be in package A1. It should be, but if it's in, if it's in package A1, why would Oh my God, don't ask these kinds of questions about it's in class, okay? So if you want to ask me these questions, ask them during office hours or ask them, ask, ask them to the TAs, right? Um, but don't interrupt the lectures, ask questions about the assignment, 
Right? You can ask them before or after class, but not uh, during class. Okay, strings in Python. Oh, question, sorry. Is that a question? Yeah. Here, there, yeah, no, no semicolon there, right? So that's not technically a statement in Java. Yeah, right here, right? Right there, yes, there's no semicolon there, right? That's not a statement in Java. That public static void main string blah, blah, blah args is not what's called a statement, that's what's called a method declaration. Right? So declarations don't have semicolons. Sorry? This thing here? Uh, so that's, yes, that's an array of strings. Sorry, by convention? This isn't by convention, this is by rule. So the language says you must have a main method that looks like this or the one on the previous way. Yeah, yes? Okay, so the uh, precise way of saying it is that the first line is a class declaration. So it says that a class exists, its name is hello world. The second line says that uh, is a method uh, declaration. It says that the method main exists. It has a one parameter of type uh, array of string, returns nothing, has these access modifiers on it. Notice there's a lot of stuff in the Java language. Right? The third line is a statement that actually prints something. So that's the precise uh, meaning of this program here. Right. There is a notebook that goes into, there's a very long notebook that goes into great gory detail about what each line means. Right. Uh, one of the criticisms leveled at Java is that there's a lot of stuff uh, that you eventually need to know just to write hello world. Right. And so for new programmers, there's questions like, does it have to be public? Does it have to be static? Does it have to be void? What do these mean? Right. All I want to do is print hello world. Why do I have to know all this stuff? Right, uh, it's just the way that the language was created. Okay, what about strings? So in Python, you know that uh, you can, uh, a string can be created, uh, sorry, the thing called a string literal. So a string that you can write down, right, uh, is always surrounded by either single quotes, right, the double quotes, triple single quotes, or triple double quotes, right, that's not shown on the slide. So all of those work in Python, right, uh, to, for strings. They all mean exactly the same thing. Uh, the one difference is that the triple quoted form, you're allowed to uh, write the string on multiple lines, right? Otherwise, um, they all mean the same thing, right? So in Java, if you try to write down a string, it has to be double quoted, right? And it has to be on one line. So there's no multi-line, uh, well you can't write a multi-line string the way that you can write a multi-line string in Python. Right. So double quotes, hello world, uh, and double quotes. The other two are versions of hello world in other languages. Right. Notice there's a bunch of other stuff here that looks different than Python, right? There's this string thing here, and there's also those semicolons at the end of each statement. Right. I'll explain what this string thing is shortly. Okay, printing stuff in Python is nice, right? You've got this one function called print. You can give print a comma separated list of stuff and it prints all the stuff, right? Inserts a space by default, right? It, the other thing that print does in Python is that it sticks a new line character here, right? And so if you try to print something else, it'll print out starting on the next line. If you want to print everything on one line and then continue printing on the same line, right, you have to tell print you want to do that by uh, specifying the end character up here. I don't know if you were taught that in 121 or not. Okay, so if I try to print two, comma, and then the string plus, right, and then the number three, and then the string equals, and then the number five, right, this works exactly the way you would hope it works. It prints out two plus three equals five. Right. Now in Java, the uh, method println, right? You can only pass it one thing, right? So here I can pass it as many things as I want. Java, it's zero or one. So if I wanna print the same thing in Java, uh, then I can't write two comma, string plus comma, right, and so on and so on and so forth. Instead, what I need to do is I need to compute the string that I want to print and then ask Java to print that string, 
So the way that you compute the string that you want to print is that you uh, concatenate or join, that's the fancy word for join in uh, computer science, right? Uh, you wanna join a bunch of stuff together. So Java's concatenation operator is the plus sign. Right? So if you write anything plus a string, or a string plus anything, Java performs string concatenation, right? Converts the two to a string, or more precisely, converts the two to its string representation, right? And joins that to the string plus, all right? And that produces a new string, right? That's a string plus three, so it computes the concatenation of all of that, produces a new string, Right? That is all now a string, so it can concatenates that with equals, producing a new string. Right? That's all a string now. That concatenates with five to produce a new string. Right? When I say produce a new string, it is literally producing a new string every time. Right? So this ends up producing one, and then two, and then three, and then finally four strings, and then finally it prints that last string. Yes? Yes, absolutely. Yes, so that's what's going on. So uh, basically the question was, I'm just gonna do this in shorter form. So I'm not gonna write the whole thing, so I'm just gonna do the first part, right? So there's two plus, right? So if I do that, right, it prints out two plus, right? Uh, but you could, in this example here, simply do two like that. Right, so put everything inside the strings, uh, inside the double quotes, right, and that will print out the exact same thing, right? Now, of course, if you didn't have the number two, but instead you had a variable, right, I wanted to write whatever the value of x is plus something. Right, now I can't, uh, so now, and I write that, that way, that does what we hope it does. Right? And of course, if I try to write x plus inside the, rum, inside the uh, parentheses, this doesn't work anymore. Or it doesn't do what we want it to do, instead it prints x plus. Right? So if, uh, if you wanted the variable in place of the two, right, you really do have to do it the way that I showed you on the slide. No, oh, wrong one, sorry. No, oh, still the wrong one. Okay. Right, so println in uh, Java uh, only accepts zero or one things. If you give it zero things, it prints nothing. println will then insert a new line character at the end of that, and so when it prints something else, it'll print it out on the next line. Right. Okay, if you wanna print every, some, everything out on one line and not go to the next line after you print it, there's a different function for that. Right, so. Oh, sorry. Let me put this back to the fault, to what we had before. So two plus, like that. Okay, so if I get rid of the ln and just do print, right? And then on the next line, uh, two plus three, like that. Right. Uh, this is going to print out two, space plus space, not go to the next line, then it's gonna print out three, and then it's gonna to go to the next line, right? So that will print out two plus three on one line. If I go to print something else out, it'll show up on the next line, right? So print does not append the new line character to the end of the output, right? Any subsequent print operation will then happen on the same line, right? Print ln, always appends the new line character to the end of the line. Any subsequent operation will then print on the next line, so here. Right. And if you give uh, print or print ln nothing, that's not an error, right? If you give print ln nothing, it prints nothing, inserts the new line character, and the output will now happen here. Uh, and if you give print nothing, it prints nothing and stays on the same line. Yeah, oh, okay. 
Okay, so notice uh, in that example there, uh, when I created the variable s uh, in Python, um, I don't have to do anything special to make the variable. Right? I can just say s equals hello world, and I can say this at any point uh, in a Python program. Right? Uh, so the variable s doesn't need to exist. Right? The first time I use it, right, or the first time I use it uh, or declare it right there, right? Python makes the variable s right, and assigns it a value. So here, uh, it looks like we're assigning the string hello world to s. What's actually happening is something different. I'll get to that in just a second. On the next line, it looks like we're assigning the number one, two, three to s. And then on the next line, it looks like we're assigning the list one, two, three to s, right? And so s in Python is just a name, right? And the name can actually refer to anything, Right? It can refer to a string, it can refer to a number, it can refer to a list or anything else that you want in Python. Right? It can even refer to a function um, or something else. Right? So Python variables, uh, they have no type associated with them. Right? They can store whatever value uh, you want. Uh, and that's not true in Right. So in Java, when you make a variable, you also have to say what type are you going to store in that variable. Right? And so if I make a string, if I have a variable s, right, I can't just say s, right? I have to say, before I use it the first time, I have to say s is going to be a string, right? And now I can store uh, what looks like a string in s, right? If I want a number or an, an integer number, right, I can't store it in s, right? If I try to store it in s, the compiler will complain. It'll say, hey, you're trying to store an int in a variable that's supposed to store a string. Right? And so what I have to do is I have to make a new variable. Right? I can't use s again. Right? I have to make a variable t, but when I make the new variable, I also have to say what its type is. Right? And so now I have to say that it, it's an int. Right? I'm gonna explain all these types shortly. Right? And now I can do that. If I want a list, it's even worse. Right? It's not just a list, it's this list, and then I got this funny angled brackets, and then I've got this word integer. Right? Making the list, I can't use the square brackets. I have to write this stuff on the other side, right? If I want to put the numbers one, two, three in the list, I now have to write some more code to add the numbers one, two, three to the list, right? We'll get to all, exactly what all of this means uh, probably in a couple of weeks, right? But it's not anywhere near as nice as uh, creating a list in Python. So, uh, it, part of the trick in Java is that uh, you must know what your types are, right? In Python, you can get, write a lot of Python and never actually realize that there's types flying around. Uh, in Java, you don't have that luxury, right? Every variable that you create has to have a type, right? When you create the variable, you must say what its type is, right? Uh, and uh, once you've made the variable, you can just use the variable without referring to its type, right? The first time you make the variable, you have to say what its type is. Right? And the variables can only hold values of the declared type. Right? Furthermore, you can't change the type. Right? So here, when I've made the string, uh, when I've made the variable s and said it's a string, it's always a string. Right? There's no way for you to say later on in the same what's called block, uh, s is some other type. Right? That won't work. Okay, now what about naming in uh, Java? So just like class names, uh, Java variable names follow a naming convention. So in Java, the convention for naming variables is that they must always start, or they should always start, with a lowercase letter. Right? You are not allowed to put spaces in the variable name, but that's also true in Python. Right? You can use the underscore and numbers if you like. Uh, numbers are acceptable if they make sense. Uh, the underscore is generally discouraged, but sometimes makes sense. Right? Um, and instead of using uh, upper camel case for multi-word variable names, you should use lower camel case for multi-word variable names, right? So if you have a multi-word variable name, the second word and following, every other word after it, should start with a capital letter, right? So little a, big L list, right? Not a, little l list, right? That's a multi-word name. The second word, third word, fourth word, one, should start with a letter. Again, the compiler doesn't care, right? So if we go over to Eclipse, if we go over to Eclipse, right, I can make a variable, uh, 
uh, y. Right? So I can make it an uppercase letter, uh, and the compiler doesn't care. It'll run. Come on, it'll run. Right? Uh, let me make a multi-word name. So, oh, let's do multi-word name. Right? You can write it all out in lowercase. Again, compiler doesn't care. Right? I can run that. Everything's fine. Right? I can write that out in all caps. Compiler still doesn't care, right? Uh, and that will run just fine, right? The convention though in Java, so other Java, well, sorry, experienced Java programmers will care, right? If you write code like this and show it to them, they'll uh, kind of look at you in a strange, funny way, right? Um, so the convention for variable names in Java, use a lowercase letter, use lower camel case for the other words in the letter. Uh, sorry, other words in the variable name. Okay, the question that was asked 10 minutes ago, what do comments look like? So in Python, all comments, there's only one comment type in Python, right? It starts with the hashtag. Uh, and comments in Python are always line ending, right? And so here, I've got hashtag initial investment, right? Uh, after the hashtag, whatever you put in here is simply ignored by the interpreter, right? It just goes to the next line and away you go. Right, I've got another comment here the annual interest rate in percent, right? And of course, uh, you should know that you can put the comment uh, anywhere you want, but as soon as you put it in, it ends the line, right? So whatever is here has to be syntactically correct Python, right? As long as it is, you can insert a comment, uh, and sorry, that has to complete the Python statement, right? After that, you can put a comment if you like, and everything's fine. Right. Uh, Java has, yes, question about this material. Is this covered on quiz one? I mean, a test, it could be. Oh yeah, anything in the lectures is fair game for the test. Um, it could be. Okay, so in Java, uh, you, there's two different types of comments. Um, so the equivalent comment in, Python, in Java is the double forward slash, right? So two slashes, no space between them right, indicates the uh, uh, start of a line ending comment, right? So the exact same code as, well, sorry, the equivalent Java code compared to the Python code from the previous slide looks like this, right? So instead of the hashtag, doubled forward slash. Okay. However, Java also has multi-line comments. So a multi-line comment starts with slash star and it ends with the next star slash. So, slash star, initial investment and annual interest rate in percent, right? So I can have a comment that spans more than one line. Can't have a string that spans more than one line, but you can have a comment that spans more than one line, right? And this form of commenting uh, allows you to insert a comment into the middle of a statement, right? So here I can write double final value equals, and then I can stick in a comment as long as it's the slash star form, right? The compiler simply ignores all of this, right? And then continues reading the rest of it, right? And so this works just fine in Java. Right? So back here, I've already created uh, the interest uh, class that has a main method in it that has that exact uh, comment in it, right? And if you run, oh, I've, I'm also printing out the final value at the end, right? And so if you run that, uh, you see that after 10 years, I guess, of uh, compounding interest at 1.25% a year, right, you'll end up with $113, which is not a very good investment. But um, uh, this does in fact do what you want it to do. Okay, so, oh, notice back here in Python, you've got the star, star oh, question, yeah. Right here? Yeah. yeah, I'll explain that in a minute. Yeah. Oh yeah, notice in Python, you've got the star star operator, right? That's exponentiation. One plus r raised to the power 10, right? Uh, there is no exponentiation operator in Java, right? So you can't write star star 
If you write the caret, it's not the right operator. It won't do what you want, right? You have to call a, you have to call, um, a method to actually compute something raised to the power of something else, right? And so the method that you need to use is this thing called big M math dot P-O-W, right? Math dot pow, pow is short for power, right? That's the base, so one plus R, that's the exponent, right? And so you have to use this uh, method to perform exponentiation, right? Exponentiation is not built in uh, to the language itself. Yes, question? No, so you could be asked to translate Python statements into Java, yeah. Hopefully those are, that's supposed to be a straightforward question, right? That's supposed to be a question that everybody should get right. I guarantee you not everybody's gonna get it right, right, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that computes, mathematically that would be one plus r all raised to the Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so star is the multiplication operator. That's right. The asterisk. Yeah. Yeah. Mathematically, that formula is that. Yeah. That's just the compound interest formula. I don't know if you learned that in high school or not. Um, uh, so the operators are this, the other operators are the same as Python. Right, so minus plus division behaves differently, right? Negation uh, and the plus sign in front of a variable does what you think it should do, right? So you can write plus five, and that's just the number five, right? Uh, you can write minus five, that's just the number minus five. No explanation. Okay, uh, I'm going to get to your question shortly. All right, so um, types exist in Python. It's just that they're never, it's uh, usually you're not explicit about the types in Python. Um, and so uh, even though, so you may or may not be aware that Python has types, but it does have types, or at least it provides the illusion of types, right? And these types do have names in Python, right? And so the value true or the value false, right? Big T, big F, uh, these are called bool in Python, right? Bool's short for Boolean or logical, right? True or false. If you write a number, like one, and there's no decimal point in it, right? Python considers that to be an integer and its type is called int, right? As soon as you put a decimal in the number, Python thinks that that's a real number, right? And the type for that is called float, right? So one dot or one dot zero, one dot zero, 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 one, those are all floats in Python. Those are, yes, so the computing science name for that is a floating point type. Uh, probably, well, there will be questions related to floating point, yes. Inside sing, anything inside single, double, or triple quotes is a string. The type for that in Python is str, right? Square brackets are a uh, list, so that indicates a list in Python, right? The type for that is a uh, little l list. Okay, so what about Java? So Java has all of the same things. They behave differently than they do in Python, right? But again, in Java, you actually have to specify the type the f when you make a variable, right? So if you want a true false value, that's a Boolean, little b Boolean, right? Not little b bool, not big b bool, not big b Boolean. Big b Boolean is something else, right? Little b Boolean, true and false are lowercase. So in Java, uh, yeah, in Java. So little t true, little f false. If you try to use uppercase true or uppercase false, the compiler will complain. Right. If you want an, int an integer type in Java, it turns out there's more than one. There are, I don't remember how many, four or five, I think. There's a bunch of them. Right. But the one that corresponds most closely to the Python int is also called int, right? So little i int. Now, what happens if you want a floating point number? And so in the interest calculation, the result's a floating point value. So I want a double there, right? So the double in, Py in Java corresponds to Python's float, right? If I want to compute a real value, right? Normally what you reach for is something called double. Now, 
The confusing thing about this in Java is that Java also has a type called float, right? Little f float, right? It also represents floating point values, but the types of floating point value, the range of floating point values that you can represent with a float is much smaller than the range of floating point values that you can represent using a double. So if you want a floating point number in Java, normally you reach for the type double, right? Not the type float. The name float and double, they, uh, their, their names are significant. Um, and we'll get to that in a few days. Okay, so here's a change, right? So uh, if you want a string, right, suddenly the type changes slightly, right? It's not little s string, it's big S string, right? And if you want a list, it's not little l list, it's big L list, and there's extra stuff that you have to fill in here as well, or should fill in, right? And so you might wonder why, is there something significant about this, right? Is there something significant about the little b and the capital S? And the answer is yes, there is something significant. Right, so Java has what are two different types of variables. Sorry, two different types of, well, two different types of variables, two different types of values, right? And so Java has this notion of what's called a primitive type and what's called a reference type, right? Python does not have this, ref, uh, this distinction. In Python, everything is a reference type, and I don't know, they usually don't tell you this in 121. Did they tell you this in 121? Have you ever seen the word reference in 121? You really should have been taught what a reference means in 121. Uh, I have to speak to whoever's taught teaching 121. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff you're missing. Uh, so Java has what are called reference types. In Python, everything is a reference type. Right. So in, in Python, if you write something like x equals one, right, I think you all know that what that statement means is that x is a variable, right? And hopefully you know that uh, when you make a variable, right, uh, there's actually something labeled x in memory, right? For your computer to use a value, that value has to be in memory somewhere, right? So when you make this variable x, somewhere in computer memory, there's this box that gets labeled x, right? Now, the question is, is so over here, I'm just gonna draw a table and this is gonna be my really simplified uh, picture of computer memory, right? So in this table, I've got this box labeled X, and I get to store a value in that box. I can only store one value. So that's the one of the, that's what I'm gonna do in this picture here, right? So in this box, I can write down one thing, right? So in Python, when you write this down, you don't store the number one store something else, right? So if you think that that's your picture of computer memory in Python, it's actually wrong, right? So that's wrong, right? X does not point to the, or X does not refer to the value one. Instead, it refers to something else. So instead, X actually stores what's called a reference to something called an int object, right? And what the heck does all that mean, right? And so uh, I told you the first class that this is a, uh, an introduction to object-oriented programming, right? You took a whole Python course and you probably were never told the, or told the phrase object-oriented programming. And now I'm telling you that in Python, in fact, this thing, X, this value one is in fact corresponds to an object of some kind. Right? An object is just something in computer memory that uh, has a value or values, right? And so what does this mean? It means that somewhere in memory, there's an int object. So somewhere else in memory, I'm just gonna draw a box. I'm gonna label it int object of some kind, right? Somewhere in that int object is the number one, right? And there's probably a bunch of other stuff here. We don't care what the other stuff is. Right? That reference, you can think of it as an arrow to that thing there. Right? And so all this reference does is it lets the Python interpreter find the object whose actual value is one. Right? So if you write y equals two, 
same thing happens, right? You get a variable y. It's a reference to an int object, right? Somewhere else in memory, there is another int object whose value is two, right? And now that thing here simply points to that object there, right? Okay, so now what happens if you say z equals one? Right, so if you say z equals one, the interpreter is smart enough to know, hey, there's already an object whose value is one sitting in memory somewhere, so z is also a reference to an int object, right? And that can refer to the same object as that one there, right? And so that's what happens in Python, believe it or not, right? Now, you might say this is, uh, why does it do it this way? It turns out there's a lot of reasons for doing it this way, right? Um, one of the nice things about this in Python is that ints in Python, they have no upper or lower bound. Right? And so you can make an int and you can store whatever int you want as long as that value fits in memory. Right? So as long as you can fit all those digits in computer memory, Python will happily store that for you. Right? And it'll even perform calculations for you. You're gonna see shortly in a second that that's not true in Java. Right? So that's the picture, that's what references are. Right? References are just, you can think of them arrows or pointers or something else, right? some way to find something in memory. Right, so if you have a reference type, it's never storing the value itself, it's storing something that lets either the interpreter or the, or the computer to find out what is the actual value that you are referring to. Yes, question. What's the actual point of view from the reference So from the programming point of view, uh, so from a most programming points of view, you won't see any difference, right? So for example, in your Python, like, in, that's why in 121 they never tell you about this, right? Imagine telling this to a first, to a programmer who's never, to someone who's never programmed before, right? It's much easier to pretend that X is just one, right? This is what's actually happening, and it turns out there's lots of reasons why you want to do this sort of thing, right? Now, some of you might be asking, hey, look, if I have to, getting the value one here, if I have to jump and get this value here, doesn't that take time, or isn't that more expensive than just using the value one? The answer is yes, it turns out it's a lot more expensive than just using the value one, right? And so Python is slower than languages like, uh, sorry, Python is often slower uh, in languages like Java or C that don't do it this way, right? But there's, a, there's always a trade-off, right? Uh, and I'll explain one of those trade-offs probably in the next lecture. Okay, so that's what a reference type is. Java also has reference types, right? Anything that begins with an uppercase letter is a reference type. Big S string is a reference type. Big L list is a reference type. Big A array list, which no one's asked me about yet, um, is also a reference type, right? So in Java, when you make a string, you get exactly that picture there, right? S equals hello. S doesn't actually store the string hello. It stores a reference to an object whose value is hello, right? Okay. What about these lowercase things? The lowercase things are primitive types. So the primitive types are not reference types. They actually store the value, right? So they behave the way you think they should behave, right? So in Java, for primitive type, if I write x equals one, then your picture of computer memory looks the way you probably want it to look, right? X is the value one. When it goes to get the value one, it's sitting right there. It doesn't have to follow an indirection to get to an object and then ask the object for the value one, right? It simply has the value one, right? And so that's the difference. So that's why there's this convention in Java, right? When you name a class, always give it an uppercase letter because that tells everybody this is a reference type. Right? It turns out classes make defined types. Right? Uh, you can't make your own lowercase types. Well, sorry, you can make them, but that's gonna confuse everybody. Right? So when a Java programmer sees a lowercase type, like int or little d double or little b boolean, they're thinking this is a primitive type. Right? 
unless you're a jerk and you name your class starting with a lowercase letter and then you confuse everybody. Right? So that's the reason why uh, there is this naming convention. Yes, question. So there's a lot of advantages that reference types give you compared to primitive types. Right? The advantage of a primitive type is that, especially for simple types like numbers, right, is that the computer can immediately get the value of the number. Right? X equals one, that's the value one. Right? It doesn't have to do this indirection. The disadvantage with this is that you're stuck with however are represented on your computer. I'm not going to get to that. Uh, but that's going to be the next, uh, the start of the next lecture, right? The fact that I'm now stuck with what value I can store here is a problem because the size of the value that I can store here is limited, right? The way that computer works is, is that whatever chunk of memory this is, there's a, it's small, right? For our, for our purposes, it's some small-ish number of bits, right? Any value that doesn't fit in that number of bits, I can't store. Right, and so, but there are a myriad of other reasons why you want to do this, right? Um, and that leads to CISC 220, which is your systems programming course where you learn about C and pointers. Um, okay, I have to stop there. We are out of time. Um, I can answer your question, though.